and welcome to Accepted, Secrets of the New York City School Admissions. I'm Victoria Chapman, and I'm here with Alina Adams, author of the ebook Getting Into New York City Kindergarten. And we are covering just what that talks about. Not only kindergarten, but the New York City school system across the board. Alina is an expert extraordinaire. Hi, Alina. Hi, Vicki. And um, previously, we gave an overview of what this podcast is going to be about, what to expect, and a little bit about the age cutoffs for kindergarten. Moving on today, we're going to talk a little bit about private schools and Hunter College Elementary. So, Alina, what is Hunter College Elementary? Hunter College Elementary is a public-private partnership. It is a school under the auspices of Hunter College, but it's a school that doesn't cost any money. Because it doesn't charge tuition, people tend to think of it as a public school, but it's actually not a public school. It is not under the Department of Ed, which means it doesn't have to follow the curriculum of the Department of Ed. It doesn't have to follow every time the Department of Ed changes its mind and implements something new. So it really is the best of both worlds. It's a school which you don't have to pay for, but it's also a school that's not subject to the whims of the DOE. It is a K-12 school, and it is school for the gifted. Okay, so um, who can attend this school? Is it open um, to everybody within all the boroughs? There are two entry points for Hunter College schools. The kindergarten entry point is only open to residents of Manhattan, which means you can only apply if you live in Manhattan or are planning to live in Manhattan at the time that your child would start kindergarten. The high school, which starts at the seventh grade, is open to children from all boroughs. Okay, and um, as you said, you talked about the application. How do you apply to Hunter? Well, one of the reasons that we're talking about Hunter right now is because like the private schools, Hunter has already opened its application process. The applications are already online. If you go to my book, Getting Into NYC Kindergarten, there's actually a link that you can click and it will take you straight to the application. Now, the Hunter College um, Elementary application process is not easy, so you have to prepare yourself for it. The first thing you need to do is fill out the application. Now here's where it gets tricky. This application, after you fill it out, you only have three weeks in which to get your child tested by a psychologist that's approved by Hunter College Elementary. They publish a list. So you have to make an appointment with this psychologist to have your child tested. Your child will take a test called the Stanford Binet. That is an IQ test. Um, Okay, before we get to that, You say there's a list of psychologists that they have to have. How extensive is this list? Because I imagine the application um, applicants are are, are numerous. Yes, which is why I strongly recommend that you make your appointment as soon as you can. But on the other hand, if you want your child tested, say, in November, don't fill out your application in September because you only have three weeks to do it. So make sure that if you have a prime testing date for your child to take the IQ test, you want to fill out your application within that three-week period. Okay, and this IQ test is what is um, administered by the psychologist. Yes. It's a one-on-one test, which is both verbal and nonverbal. Um, are there any costs involved? Yes, there is. The test actually costs several hundred dollars. You can check the exact fee. There are waivers. You can apply for a waiver if you are low income, but otherwise the test will run you several hundred dollars. Um Are they connected with any type of a pre-K? I think you indicated that um, in your book that they had a pre-K and it's been eliminated. Yes. Can you explain? Back in the day, Hunter College Elementary School did have a pre-K, but they eventually agreed that three years old is way, way too young to check test a child for giftedness and that the scores that they got were really unreliable. The fact is, even the scores that you get on a four-year-old are very unreliable. Most people will agree that an IQ doesn't stabilize until about 10, 11, 11, 12, maybe at 8 years old you're getting a relatively good reading, but it's a very unreliable test. But still, it's the test that they use. In fact, here's something funny. They use a test called the Stanford Binet. And if you read what Dr. Binet, who is clearly one of the creators of the test, wrote, he said, under no circumstances is this test ever to be used as the single source for qualifying to place a child in a gifted program. In fact, the test was created to test the bottom end of the IQ to see which children need special help. 
it wasn't really developed to test the top of the IQ scale, but that's what it's being used for. Okay, and so if three years old is too young, why do we know that four years old is is sufficient? Well, here's something interesting about Hunter, another thing about Hunter College Elementary. A longitudinal study was done where they took 20 years of Hunter College Elementary students and tested um, and went back and saw where they were in their lives. And guess what happened? All these incredibly gifted four-year-olds... It was a perfect bell curve. There were a few people who were um, very, very successful in their fields. There were a few people who were very, very sort of non-successful by whatever measure that they were using. And the bulk of them were smack dab in the middle. Look, here's the thing. I mean, my husband went to Hunter College Elementary, and he's a very nice human being. But there are no Nobel Prizes at our house. It's, it's a school that they call a school for the gifted, but it really is just a school for bright, articulate kids with college-educated parents. Okay, so what are some of the pros for going to hunt um, for looking at Hunter College? Well, the biggest one is it doesn't cost you anything. That's always great. I always count that as a pro. The other thing is that it is a K to twelve school, and the kids from the elementary school move pretty much automatically into the high school. Although, again, for the record, the kids that tend to come in at the high school level tend to do better academically because it's much easier to measure the intelligence of a 10, 11, 12 year old than it is of a four year old. The other thing is, as I said, it's not part of the DOE, which means it doesn't have to change every time the DOE puts out a new edict. The peer group is very, very good because you have a lot of bright, motivated kids and very, very bright, very motivated parents who want to make the school the best that it can be. But the point, um, main point to remember here is just taking that IQ test is only the beginning of the process. The fact is about 2,500 kids take the test to get into Hunter College Elementary. Then Hunter takes the top 250. They don't have a hard IQ cutoff because they take the top 250 kids. So usually it's been around the 98.5th percentile the last few years, but that number changes year to year. It's very close year to year, but they don't release the Mm -hmm. number until after they've tested all the kids. So then they take the top 250 scorers. But wait, you're not in yet. There's something called the second round at Hunter's, which, by the way, is always done around Martin Luther King Day weekend. So if you think your child has a good shot at getting into the second round, don't make any plans for Martin Luther King Day weekend. What they do is they take the kids in small groups and they lead them in sort of a mock class play group and they observe them. Nobody knows what exactly they're looking for. That's a deep, dark secret. But after they've observed these top 250 kids, they select 25 girls, 25 boys, 12 girls to go on the wait list, 12 boys to go on the wait list, and that's it. The wait list they hold until second grade, and I have known some people who got into Hunter at first or second grade, but after that, that's it. You cannot get in again unless you apply at the high school level. My goodness. And any cons? Well... There's all sorts of cons to anything. Um, The school schedule, interestingly enough, at Hunter follows the public school schedule, even though they notify whether you got in with the private school schedule. So if you have one child in private school and one child at Hunter, their calendars won't mesh. Also, Hunter does not have a sibling policy like a lot of other schools do. So if you have one child at Hunter, odds are not particularly good that your next child will get in. And for a lot of kids, it's a lot of pressure. It's a very fast-paced environment. It's a very high-achieving environment. And some kids just don't want to particularly work at that level, whether or not they qualified for it or not. Okay. Well, then I guess that's why it's considered a gifted education it's, program. It's, exactly. Absolutely. Also, they don't have a set curriculum, so every teacher is sort of doing their own thing. And Hunter is kind of legendary for the fact that there are some really, really great teachers and there's some pretty not so great teachers that you want your kid to avoid that if you're connected you know I don't want my child to have that teacher okay um well that sounds like a pretty decent summation on that um when we come back we'll look at private schools and how you get into those Welcome back to Accepted Secrets of New York City School Admissions with Alina Adams. 
I'm Victoria Chapman, and I'm here with, of course, Alina Adams, author of the ebook Getting Into New York City Kindergarten. Uh, we just finished talking a little bit about the Hunter College um, Elementary School, and we're moving on to the conversation about private school and admissions. Okay, private school. That covers a lot of ground. It does. It really does. The most important thing to know that private schools have in common is that they have all put their applications up online already, which means that if you want your child to go to private school in September of 2016, September 2015, October 2015, November, December is when you should be applying them. You should be have asked for your application already because while most schools will pretty much interview every candidate and consider every candidate. There are a few schools that will only give out a finite number of applications, not spaces to attend, but just applications. So some of them say at 500, we won't give out any more applications. So if there's a school you absolutely have your heart set on, don't dawdle. Make sure you get that application as soon as possible. Okay. I want to backtrack a little bit. What is a private school? What are the types of private schools? Well, the most basic thing is a private school is a school that will charge tuition. Although there are a few private schools in New York City that are tuition free. They're usually funded by grants or other other forms of funding. Most private schools are also called independent schools because they are independent. They are not controlled by the city. They do not have to take the tests that the city and the state give. Some of them give them to their children anyway just to see how they would stack up, but they are not obligated to do it. They can have different hours. They can have different curriculums. They can have teachers that might, for instance, have master's degrees in their subject rather than in education. These teachers do not have to be certified by the state. They're usually not unionized, but that's because private schools can do things differently than the public schools have to do. And as far as the different kinds of private schools, there's an almost infinite variety. As I always tell people, this is New York City. You can pretty much have anything you want. The question is, how badly do you want it? You can have private schools that are all boy, or private schools that are all girl, or private schools that are co-ed. You can have private schools that are kindergarten to fifth grade, private schools that are kindergarten to eighth grade, private schools that are kindergarten to twelfth grade. You can have a traditional curriculum. You can have a progressive curriculum. You can have a curriculum that focuses on social justice. Basically, private schools... Religious? Well, that's the interesting thing. Most people think, when they think of religious schools, they think of Catholic schools which are actually not independent schools. There are a few independent schools that are also Catholic. For instance, Sacred Heart for Girls, St. David for Boys. You can also have some Jewish schools like the Rota Shalom School, the Heschel School, the Ramaz School. These are independent schools, but they're different from Catholic schools, which are run by the diocese, and they're different from yeshivas. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. We'll we'll go through all of it. All right. Okay. We will get through more of that. Now, you might mention cost. What are, what are the opportunities for, what are the costs? What are financial aid? What, what are the opportunities in that area? Most schools cost around the area of $40,000 a year, 5000 less, 5000 no. more. There are a few schools that are in the 20000 numbers. Sometimes there are schools, again, that are either subsidized by private grants or by different organizations. There is financial aid available at absolutely every school. That's something that I want to stress. If you think that you make too much to get financial aid in a New York City private school, you may be surprised. There are people who are getting financial aid that you wouldn't imagine with the amount of money that they make. They're getting financial aid. And here's a tip, and it's very counterintuitive, but here's the thing to remember. If you need financial aid, you might be better off applying to a much more expensive school than a school that's less expensive because a very, very expensive school tends to have a large endowment and they know their students are going to need financial aid so they're prepared for it, Uh whereas a school that's a lot cheaper might not have the endowment. They're operating on sort of a razor's edge and are not prepared to give as much financial aid. It's very conceivable that you could apply to a school that costs $20,000 a year and end up paying $15,000 a year, whereas you could apply to a school that charges $40,000 Forty thousand a year and be paying ten thousand a year. Okay. Okay. I'm sure there's many, many levels with that, and I'm sure your book helps. It does, and there's also a link to a form in the book. You fill out one form that goes to an independent clearinghouse, and they have an algorithm where they figure out how much you should be paying. 
And there's something to remember. You will get a number with your acceptance letter of how much your financial aid will be. It is okay to go back to the school and say, you know, we really don't feel this is enough. Here are our expenses. And they will sit down with you. Many schools will sit down with you and they will look over your expenses. And it's very possible that they might adjust based on what you've shown them. Now, of course, that comes down to how badly does the school want you and how much do they love you. As I always stress, it's very important to teach children that at an early age that love can only be expressed through money because that's what the schools are basically doing. They're thinking to themselves, do I really love this family? Do I want this family? How badly do I want them? Okay. Now, how do you determine which school, which type of teaching, which which is best for your child? Well, first of all, don't listen to me. Don't listen to your mother. Don't listen to your next door neighbor. Visit every single school. And even if you're... Visit every school? Visit every school that you're interested in. Thank you. But here's another thing. Visit one school that you're absolutely sure is the opposite of what you want. Because sometimes, even if you think you know exactly what you want, you might be sure that you want a traditional education, but you walk in and you go, oh my God, it's a Hitler's Youth Rally. Or you might be absolutely sure you want a progressive education, and you walk in and you go, oh my God, it's Lord of the Flies. So do not assume you know what you want until you've seen the possibilities. You might be sure you want co-ed, but visit one single sex school. You might be sure you want K-12 to because then you never have to go through this fun process again. But keep two things in mind. One, a lot of times the school that your child needs at four is not the school that they need at 16. So there's a lot of movement. You really don't know at four what kind of learner your child's going to be or what the environment will be like. And the other thing is a K-5 to school or a K-8 to school allows children at a younger age to be the big kids and to take on leadership roles. And for some kids, they need to be in that kind of environment instead of waiting until senior year to be the big man on campus. Okay, so um, we're going to talk more about visiting these schools in our next segment. So we'll be right back. Welcome back to Accepted, Secrets of New York City School Admissions with Alina Adams, author of the ebook Getting into New York City Kindergarten. I'm Victoria Chapman, and we've been talking about private schools, and uh, we're now talking about admissions to private schools. How do you navigate that? We talked about the type of schools. Now, how do you get in? Well, as I said, make sure you get that application because some schools might cut off the number of applications they give out. Then fill out your application. This isn't just a case of putting down your child's name and birth date. For private schools, they might often ask you to write essay or at least short answer questions about your child's interests, about your family, about your child's achievements, Mm -hmm. their skills. So you want to fill fill that form out. But that's not all. They're going to want to interview your child Some schools interview children in groups, some uh, schools take just two children at a time, and some schools do one-on-one interviews. In the past, children used to have to take a test for private school admissions. You might have heard it referred to as the ERB. That's actually not the name of the test. It's the name of the organization that gives it, the Educational Records Bureau. But a few years ago, so many children were scoring in the 99th percentile because they were doing test prep. Oh. That a lot of schools said, well, we're not going to take uh, we're not going to take the results of that test, or we're not going to ask for that test to be given. Although, if you have your child take that test, go ahead and send us the scores. But that's not all the schools. Some schools said, well, we still want scores and we still want test results. So, in my book, Getting Into NYC Kindergarten, there is a link you can click for a listing of which schools require which tests and which schools require a test at all. Now, do keep in mind that in New York City, and this applies to all schools, private, public, charter, what's true today may not necessarily be true tomorrow. So even though the link that we have is the most up-to-date link, you might want to go ahead and call the school to double-check what test they want, whether they need a test at all. So that's one day for your child to be tested. Yes. Quick question. You said that they may change information at any given day. 
And um, in a previous podcast, you mentioned that you have a newsletter based on changes within the Department of Education. Do you have access to some of those similar changes? I do. Within the private school system? I, I do. At the end of my book, there is a link where you can sign up to a mailing list where I send the most up-to-date changes, whether it's in the public school admissions process or the private ones. So as soon as that information becomes available, it does get sent out to you. Okay. So if you get the book, you can sign up for the mailing list. And you can get the information coming into your inbox as opposed to... As soon as it happens, hot off the press. Hunting down the school, <laughs> yes. find a phone number, and asking, did anything change? Right. Okay. Um, so so you we, mentioned application. You mentioned testing. But we're not done yet. Okay. Because, as we said, the child has to be interviewed. Yes. But then also the parents have to be interviewed. The parents also have to take a tour. Usually that tour is done on a different day from the interview. Some schools may do them together. It really depends. Here's something that I found out. I have three children, and this is something I only found out on my third child, that when you are touring the school, anything you say during the tour gets reported back to admissions. I had no idea, so, so color me naive. I didn't know. But with, this is not a great thing if you're touring with someone like my husband. Remember him? The one who went to Hunter College Elementary, so he was a gifted child. So we're riding in an elevator at a private school, and the private school is explaining how incredibly selective they are, how they get 10 applications for every one spot. And my gifted child husband says, but wait a minute, if you think about how many children there are in the city and how many schools there are and how everybody applies to about eight to ten schools, really you're only talking about two applications for every one seat. You know, this is not a school that loved us. We, we felt that. So do keep in mind that everything you say can and will be held against you when you're taking a tour of the school. Um, now, the tour, does that come after the application process? Can you tour? Do you go to open houses in advance? Different schools have different rules. Some schools will let you tour even in the spring, which is one of the reasons why I say the applications process can be 18 months long. If you think about your child starting in September of 2016 and you put in your application in September of 2015, you might have toured the spring before. So that's why it's an 18-month process. Some schools do spring tours. Some schools will not let you tour until after you have filled out the application and, hey, paid the application fee. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um... How much are those fees? $50, $100, $150. It depends on the school. Okay, so you've got an interview for the parents, you've got an interview for the child, and you've got tours. How much time should a prospective parent, well, a parent who's got a prospective student for it, you know, with their child, take off to be available for these things? Well, let's do the math like my gifted husband. We've got half a day for the child's interview, half a day for the tour, half a day for your interview, applying between 8 and 10 schools. Oh, and if you have twins, most schools will make you bring the children on separate days. And I take it you can't stack it so that you can do the parent... Um, interview uh, on the back half of the same day with the child. Some school, every school is different. I mean, some schools will do the parent interview on the day of the tour. Very few schools that I can think of will do the parent interview on the same day as the child interview. Because for one thing, what do you do with the child while you're being interviewed? That It's more of a fundamental. It's great to do it simultaneously. (laughs) a A few schools will do that, but it really depends. Plan for at least three half days off work per school. Okay. So, you've gone through the tours, the testing, the interviews, you get waitlisted. Multiple applications, how do you hedge your bets, how do you navigate this thing? Well, it used to be that you could not sign a contract with one private school and remain on the waiting list of another. That rule has since changed. So the fact is, if you are waitlisted at a school that you love, you can still sign a contract at another school and remain on the waitlist. Do keep in mind that you've signed a contract and you've probably put down a financial deposit. And if later on you need to move your child to the school, the school will very likely keep your deposit, possibly keep you on the hook for the entire year's tuition whether or not you attend, because the fact is you did sign a contract. So keep that in mind. As for how to work the wait list, 
If you really love the school, let them know. It's okay to send an email about once a week, a polite email. Don't harangue them. Don't threaten them. Don't bribe them. But sending an email explaining why you love the school, why you think the school is a perfect fit for your family, what your family will bring to the school, because that's what they want to hear. And waitlets do move. People have gotten off wait lists as late as August, so it can happen. Just be aware of the fact that if you sign a contract somewhere else, you might end up paying two years' worth of tuitions. Goodness. Um, well, that's a lot. Uh, well, we're getting ready to wrap up this podcast for today, um, but we did have a question that came in that asked about diversity in private schools. Can you speak to that? Well, first of all, what do you consider diversity? A lot of people use the word, but a lot of people have different opinions of what it means. For some people, it means race. For some people, it means ethnicity. For some people, it means socioeconomic. For some people, it means geographic. One school, when I asked about diversity, they told me they had children for both downtown and the Upper West Side. So that was their definition of diversity. You know, for some people, it's English language learners. Here's the thing. While most private schools will have a low number of English language learners simply because they're not set up the way the public schools might be to deal with children who don't speak English. Some private schools, especially ones that go out of their way to attract diversity, end up actually having higher numbers of both ethnic and racial and socioeconomic diversity than a public school in an upscale neighborhood might be. The fact is most private schools run around somewhere 20 to 25 percent racial diversity, Although some schools like uh, Manhattan Country Day, which really goes out of their way, may go up as high as 50%. But a public school on the Upper West Side or a public school on the Upper East Side, depending on the neighborhood, might actually have a lot less racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic diversity because they can't pick. They just have to take in the kids from the neighborhood. So while diversity is an issue at many, many private schools, A, a lot of private schools are working on it very aggressively. There are schools that have committees and affinity groups and all sorts of outreach. It's very possible that a private school may end up being more racially, ethnically, and socioeconomically diverse than one of the top public schools. Okay. A lot of information. Um, we're going to wrap up that the, today's podcast, and next week we're going to talk about public schools. But before that, where do you get the book again? Getting into NYC Kindergarten is available on Amazon. It's available on Barnes & Noble. And at the end of it, make sure that you sign up for the mailing list because that's where you're going to get all the latest updates. And you also um, have, um, does your newsletter talk about where you're doing your workshops? If you want to hear, come and hear me because it's not enough to just hear me on a podcast. You have to hear me in person. <laughs> if you want to do that, yes, I do free workshops. And you can find out all the dates and the locations and where you can sign up on my website. AlinaAdams.com. I have upcoming workshops in Chelsea, in Brooklyn, and on the Upper West Side. I'd love to meet you. Great. Thank you, Alina. A lot of information. Check out the book. And we'll see you next time.